It's alright. Pretty hype today. You know why? It's election day. Did you all vote? Or I mean, if you're American, because you know, and you know what else I'm doing today? I'm doing the unit test for unit uh, for the unit in Khan Academy on one dimensional motion. I've not watched any of the videos, okay? But we're flying blind here. We got we got to do this thing. All right, I'm gonna start the unit test now. Uh, I'm a squirrel drops a unicorn. Oh no, I mean an acorn, not a unicorn. Unicorns don't exist. This is physics, okay? We only deal with reality here in physics, okay? We only do reality. Me, cloud in the heads math person, said unicorn, mythical legendary creature, instead of the very real and gritty acorn being discussed here in um, in this physics problem. Just goes to show you what we the pathology of us math people. A squirrel drops an acorn onto the head of an unsuspecting dog. This is a this is a physics question. Narwhals are basically sea unicorns, so I would say they do exist. Yeah, narwhals are pretty cool. Does everybody in here know what narwhals are? Narwhals. A 15 second of video. Oh, this is an ad. <laughs> Why don't I get ad block? <laughs> I did have a chill day off. Well, uh, chill. Show me the horn. Oh my god. It's kind of like a tusk, and it's actually an overgrown tooth that grows through a hole in the narwhal's upper lip. What the fuck? It's an overgrown tooth. That's incredible. Um What the how, what? Oh my god. Have I seriously forgotten the name of your leader? Wait, how is this possible? I know she's a biochemist. God damn, what's happening to my brain? It's just not in there, people. The name is not coming to me. Why? Mom, it's not anywhere. Mom, the brain. Broken. Brain's broken. The brain is broken. Merkel! Angela Merkel! Angela Merkel! Yes! American education comes through in the clutch. Yes! Angela Merkel. That was close. Phew! Very close. Okay, um... The homotopy groups of n-dimensional spheres is in general and uh, is not a solved problem. These, this is still, uh, like, I, I, like nobody has a general formula for uh, the nth homotopy group of the k-dimensional sphere. For example, I mean there are definitely partial results that you can look up, and there, are, um, you, you know, for example, like pi n of S n is z, for example. Uh, but I think that in general, these are not fully understood or the pattern doesn't, is not understood. In fact, we could probably look at the uh, table of homotopy groups 
of spheres. I betcha um, yeah here's the table so you can see that uh, along this diagonal here we get Z's that's a stable result you can prove pi n of Sn is Z um, S1 obviously is a has a contractual universal cover, so there's nothing uh, nothing interesting about that. Uh, the higher homotopy groups there, but things get really crazy. Look at this, <laughs> Z84 cross Z2 squared. Really strange, right? Um, Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that I understand why it is so difficult um, to compute. Like, I've certainly never computed pi 13 of S2 to see Z12 cross Z2. <laughs> Beyond the first two rows, the higher homotopy groups appear to be chaotic. But in fact, there are many patterns, some ob obvious and some subtle. The groups below the jagged black line are constant along diagonals. Okay. Um, the third and fourth rows of the table are the same start are the same starting in the third column, i.e., pi i of s two is equal to pi i of s three. This is the isomorphism deduced by the hot vibration. X is congruent to six mod in this first one is six mod ten. It's X is congruent to um, what is it? Seven mod nine, and X is congruent to uh, ten mod seventeen. If we follow learning balance, what learning balance is saying, then we could say that, for example, we know that if x is equal to six mod ten, then x is going to be equal to uh, some multiple of ten plus six, right? And then we could try to look at this same equation, mod nine. I don't really understand how Chinese remainder theorem gets you at like it might tell you that there is a solution but how does it generate the solution for you I guess maybe I don't understand the isomorphism very well if you specify these three elements of the factors so we have an isomorphism from Z mod 6z cross Z mod 7 uh, oh sorry I messed up 10z cross z mod 9z cross z mod uh, 17z you get an isomorphism of this to z mod 10 times 9 times 17 which is oh my god 90 times 17 is that how this works 1530 but am I crazy or is there is it obvious how this so I have the element 6 7 10 here I mean I get some I get some element over here but I don't see how that knowledge can help us to solve this problem okay that makes more sense to me but this is not Chinese remainder theorem right you shove this thing back into the second congruence to get that 10k plus 6 is congruent to 7 mod 9. And then subtract 6 from both sides. So you get that 10k is congruent to 1 mod 9. And then what you want to be able to do is uh, 
find the multiplicative inverse of 10 mod 9. Or what am I talking about? This is k, k is equal to 1 mod 9. And that's because 10 is equal to 1 mod 9. So you can express k as some uh, multiple of 9. Let's call it 9n plus 1. And then if you stick that into here, you learn that x is equal to 10 times 9n plus 1 plus 6, which is 90n plus 16. And then if you put this into the last equation, what you get is 90n plus 16 is equal to 10 mod 17. If you subtract 16 from both sides, you get the 90n is congruent to negative 6 mod 17. 17, how many times does it go into 90? 5 times? So this is 5n is congruent to negative 6 mod 17. Now what's a multiplicative inverse of 5? 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7. So then n is congruent to negative 42 mod 17. Well, I can multiply 7 by 5, right? I can multiply both sides of this equation by 7. But the point is that 35 is congruent to 1 mod 17. A multiplicative inverse is something um, like a multiplicative inverse of b is a number a such that a times b is equal to 1. 35 is equal to 2 times 17 plus 1. So it's 1 mod 7. Now what's negative 42 mod 17? Is it positive 10? n is congruent to 10 mod 17. Wait, is it? Oh, 35, uh, 34. I was thinking about the 35. Arithmetic, okay. I have a problem with arithmetic. Negative 42. Let's see, what is the multiple of 17 there? It's negative 34 plus 17 is... Is that 51? So it's actually 9. 51, yeah. I was thinking 52 for some reason because I've, um, I've got issues. So that means n is equal to 17m plus 9. Then, okay, so then this means that x is equal to 90 times 17m plus 9 plus 16, which is... Um, Oh, I already did 90 times 17. Fifteen thirty m plus... What is this? 810. So x ends up being 826 mod 1530. I can watch anime without subs. Yes, absolutely. But I would never, ever choose to. Oh, I've just offended almost 80% of my chat, didn't I? Truth be told, I've only ever watched... No, no, no. I've watched two anime in my life. The first one was Death Note. I watched that. I thought the first part was okay. I liked the first part, but then I thought the second part was kind of lame. And then I watched Hikaru no Go. That's that one. Not well. I, w I aspire to play Go at a competent level. You know, in that uh, in that Hikaru no Goat thing, um, 
Well, that that was really weird too. Okay, it w- never quite rose to the level of toxicity that we saw in the manga guide to linear algebra. But <laughs> but it was a little bit toxic. I remember there was like the girls go team. The girls would only play go with each other, I think. Is that right? And the boys would only play go with each other. Like it's dumb as hell. Anyway. They do do that in physical sports. That is understandable. But I don't quite understand it in Go. They do it in chess too. Yes, I don't quite get it. They do it in poker too. I mean, like, there's an argument to be made for it, but it, like, comes from, like, a sexist culture, right? Like, women, um, like, they need their own league because if they play with guys it'll just be like um not necess- it's not necess- the issue is not necessarily that it would be a slaughter but it would be more like um it would just uh it, it would be they would have a miserable time oh do they have men and women and women only okay i i was unclear on that So long before fake news was a thing, there were articles about the supposed inferiority of women to men in chess. In most other domains of life, such ideas would be considered reactionary and repulsive. Yet, when writing about chess, they are somehow not only acceptable, but even mainstream. A few days ago, we saw the latest installment of this in this unsavory series, an article on the Indian website Mint titled, quote, Why do women lose in chess? and reprinted here on chess base. Like so many of its predecessors, this article asserts a gender gap in, in chess achievement and then speculates about possible contributing factors, such as male gatekeepers, lack of role models, biological differences. It quotes GM Humpy Koneru as saying that men are just better players. Quote, you just have to accept it. My namesake is one of the authors, yes. I swear to God it's not my pen name. Okay. But there is a particular, I mean, spoiler alert, okay. We find out in the course of, turn off this thing if you're going to read this piece of shit. But I highly suggest you stay far, far away from it. There is a moment in the manga where the tutor, a dude, a wimpy dude, I, I mean, like, you know, beta male. He's a beta male, okay? He's weak, okay? He's nervous around girls, okay? And he studies math all day. I know beta male, though. There is a moment where we learn about his specific pathology because he's also um, very dedicated to training in karate. And what we discover late in the manga, spoiler alert again, but, you know, I don't give a shit because you should not be reading this, um, is that he had a girlfriend when uh, he was, I don't know, younger at some point in his life. And his girlfriend started getting roughed, roughed up by a bunch of bullies, these punks, these Japanese punks started uh kind of roughing up the girl and like kind of grabbing her that sort of thing and he tried to step up and defend the girl and he got beat down he got beat down what happened in the manga is that the girl just could never look at him the same way again and it disintegrated their relationship and emasculated the dude. Now, that's the narrative, okay? That's the narrative in the manga guide to linear algebra. (laughs) 
okay? Maybe you can see why I suggest that you stay far, far away from the manga guide to linear algebra. Oh, so the reason why I'm interested in this, right, is because a similar kind of sociological observation could be made about mathematics. We can all agree, right? Look around at the top math departments, look around, well, at almost any math department. I would imagine it's the same or very similar in like physics too, maybe computer science as well. I don't know. I know I'm less familiar there, but certainly in math, there are few women in um, sort of powerful positions in mathematics. In good tradition, the article is incredibly sloppy in arguing that there is an achievement gap between women and men to begin with. The author notes that the top two female players, Hu Yifan and Koneru Humpy, are ranked 86th and 283rd in the world. Ah, this person who said that men are just better players um, is female, I believe is what the... I'm, okay, whatever. Um that no woman has been world champion and that the gap between the best female and male player is a 205 ELO, ELO points. These arguments all are variations on a common theme. Whatever metric of top players you use, women are clearly worse than men. There is a huge flaw in this argument. To fairly compare an underrepresented to an overrepresented group, you should never use the top individuals. That is a form of st statistical malpractice that wouldn't stand in an introductory college course. The Mint article points out, or sorry, excuse me. The Mint article starts out promising. It points that only 16% of the players registered with the All India Chess Federation are female and states correctly, fewer participants at the entry level results in fewer chances for the top slots. It then promptly ab abandons this key argument while giving extensive coverage to folk psychology about, quote, killer instinct and, quote, emotional sensitivity. Um, why is this a key argument? It's really quite simple. Let's say I have two groups, A and B. A has 10 people, B, group B has two. Each of the 12 people gets randomly assigned a number between one and 100. Then I use the highest number group in group A as the score for group A, and the highest number in group B as the score for group B. On average, group A will score 91.4, and group B will score 67.2. The only difference between groups A and B is the number of people. The larger group has more shots at a high score, so will on average get a higher score. The fair way to compare these unequally sized groups is by comparing their means, not their top values. Of course, in this example, that would be 50 for both groups. No difference. Yeah, fewer women play chess. One might ask why that's so. Is there just like a natural proclivity on the part of women? to not want to play chess? Or could there be other factors? Or maybe it's a combination? I don't know. At this point, you might think this is just a theoretical argument. Surely when looking at chess ratings, it cannot be that simple. So let's have a closer look at chess ratings. I downloaded the October 6th, oh, this is really new. October 6th, 2020, FIDE standard rating list selected all players of the Indian Federation and removed all junior players born 2000 and later since their ratings are not uh, are often not reliable. I was left with 19,064 players of whom 17,899 were male. That's 93.9% and 1,165, 6.1% are female. The best male player was a certain Vishwan. Nathan Anand. I've heard of that guy at 2,753. And the best female player was Humpy Koneru at 2,586, a gap of 167. Jim Koneru, ranked 15th among all Indian players, is the only female in the top 20. 
On the surface, these facts superficially seem to point to a gender, gender gap. They don't. With our thought experiment in mind, let's look at the full rating of distributions of male and female Indian players. They look like this. The huge discrepancy between the blue and orange lines reflects the participation gap. To compare the distributions more easily, we change the vertical axis from the number of players to the proportion of players. The line for female players is more jagged because there are fewer of them. But other than that, these two distributions don't look radically different from one another. Indeed, the average ratings of men, 1434, and women, 1466, are comparable. And averages are the fair metric for comparing men. Uh, is 167 points an unexpectedly large gap? Um, to answer this question, we are going to look at all ratings as a single pool, dropping the gender identifiers all together. We then randomly draw 17,899 ratings from this pool. These form the quote overrepresented group, and the remaining 1,165 ratings from the quote underrepresented group. These numbers are exactly the numbers of male and female players in our data, but we have instead created completely arbitrary groups with these numbers of individuals. We record the top rating in both groups. We repeat this process 100,000 times. Guess what? The difference between the top ratings in the overrepresented and underrepresented groups is a whopping 153 points on average, with a standard deviation of 93. <laughs> Again, remember that these groups are completely identical to each other, except in their number of individuals. The mere fact that the underrepresented group constitutes only 6.1% of the population causes a large difference in the top ratings. In this light, the real gap of 167 points could easily be due to chance instead of due to a real difference between men and women, just like the gap in our thought experiment. It is that simple. Other widely used metrics don't show evidence for a gender gap either. For example, based on participation alone, one would expect only 1.2 female players in the top 20 overall. So Humpy Kuneru, being the only female in the Indian top 20, is completely in line with statistical expectations based on the participation gaps. Gap. We conclude that at least among non-junior FIDE rated Indian players, there is no evidence that the achievement gap is anything but a participation gap. That is, that is not to deny the first-person perspective of top female players who might feel they have reached a personal ceiling in their performance. But statistically, there is nothing to suggest that top female players are underperforming given the overall ratio of female to male players. In fact, taking into account the systemic injustices and biases that they have had to overcome to get where they are, they are likely overperforming. Anyway, I wonder how much of that is applicable to math. All right. I forgot what we were... Oh! I'm so I started um, the Khan Academy uh, unit test. The first question on this is about a squirrel dropping a acorn onto the head of an unsuspecting dog. See? Um, the acorn falls four meters before it lands on the dog. How do I say squirrel? Is it? What? <laughs> squirrel. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, but okay. I'm glad you like it. I'm glad it makes you happy. Um, Guys, I'm taking a physics test, but you can interrupt my physics test anytime you want, okay? Oh my god, are you serious? X to the fourth? Oh my god, look at look at that guy. All right, you want to know the real answer? The way that any sane person 
factors that? I'm, I'm looking at it right now. The way any sane person factors that. Wolfram Alpha. That's what you do. Okay. Yeah. Wolfram Alpha. That's there it is. Now, you won't always have Wolfram Alpha at your disposal, right? So you probably need to use something, some kind of tool, maybe. Neither one nor negative one work, right? Oh my god, neither one nor negative one work, right? I don't think two works either. GG. I give up. Okay, so um right. <laughs> and you have to do the plus and the minuses, right? The pluses and the minuses. Who did this to you? Who did this to you, Jose? I'm trying to be clever and stuff. I'm not sure if it gets anywhere. Because seven's not divisible with 27. Um, no, not the quartic formula. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, not the quartic formula. So just in case you ever wanted to know what the quartic formula looked like, here's the formula for the first root. right? Here's the formula for the second root. Look, a plus. You get the point. All right, so what do sane individuals do non-toxic math uh what do non-toxic people do in when facing down a polynomial such as this we don't just give up oh no we don't just give up no, we don't right, care about wolves wool from alpha no we don't guess Okay, we put it into here. Oh, I should probably tell it I want roots. And we note uh, that three is a root. Ah, oh, we also note that negative two is a root. We have a triple root. Look at this. Yeah, but neither nobody in chat had the capabilities of sticking in negative two or three for that matter into that polynomial. Nobody wanted to do that. Because Yeah. Yeah, three to the fourth. Are you kidding me? I mean tamely ram if I put it perfectly. You, three to the four. I, I guess it's eighty-one, but I barely know three cubed. Three cubed is twenty-seven. Yeah. Kappa Klaus tried two i. That's amazing. Now, if only you two tried two i squared, you're almost there. Okay, wait, we're memeing too hard, okay? Because Jose has a real question here. So the way that you would go about doing this, the way that you would really go about doing this is you would plug in what are called the... So Descartes came up with a theorem. Descartes, the guy who thought animals had no souls and would vivisect them live. That guy, the... Cognito ergo sum guy, that guy. Um, <laughs> uh, never mind. Um, 
That guy came up with a theorem about roots of polynomials called the rational roots theorem. Have you heard of it? And it says the following. Um, so suppose you want to find uh, a root of the polynomial let's call it uh let's try to be general here so let's maybe write a n x to the n plus a n minus one x to the n minus one don't actually care about these terms here but the last guy is um, a one x plus a naught so please understand these are the coefficients of the polynomials the a's are the coefficients of the polynomial So suppose that you want to find a root of this polynomial. Uh, suppose further that the root is rational. So what rational here means is that um, we can express it. This means... as uh, plus or minus p over q, where p and q are integers, positive integers. I should say either, plus or minus q. then the fact is that p divides a naught and q divides a n did i get that right So uh, when you're faced with a complicated polynomial, if you suspect that one of the roots is rational, then what you can try to do, and, and by the way, very frequently in textbook problems, that is to say problems crafted by that you find in a textbook. So not like real, quote unquote, real world problems, but textbook problems it will very frequently be the case that there will be some rational root. Then a good set of things to try just by merely testing is to look at, so let, let's take your polynomial, for example, the one you gave me, which was x to the fourth minus seven x cubed plus nine x squared plus 27 minus 54. That's the polynomial. Oh, great. Thanks. An's not zero. Oh, I, this is still, is this still? No, it's okay. I hope it's okay. Toxic math. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, suppose we have this. So then um, what has to be true about a rational root, one that can be, um, one that can divide a naught and one that can divide, sorry. What has to be true about a rational root is that P must divide one and Q must divide 54. 
or re rather, I guess, negative 54. So this creates a list of possible, uh, of possible rational roots. So for example, I'm kind of uncomfortable with how I've stated this, but Like maybe I want a not to be non-zero as well. Anyway, so we have that uh, the only possible things here are p equal to one and q equal to, let's see, what? Oh, I've done this completely wrong, huh? Sorry. <laughs> p has to divide negative 54 and q has to divide one, my bad. So the only possibilities are p is equal to, um, if p is going to be a positive integer, it could be 1, could be 2, could be 3, could be 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, hey. 27 or 54 and Q has to be equal to one. There's only one possibility. So then what you get is a list of possible rational roots. And every rational root is included in this list. And this is going to be plus or minus P over Q, where P is one of these. So, uh, for example, we get 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, 18, 27, 54. But we also get negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 6, negative 9, negative 18, negative 27, negative 54. So, in other words... There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16 possible rational roots to this polynomial. And your job is to figure out which one is a rational root. And it might be that none of them work. None of them are a root, which is extreme, would be extremely unfortunate. But in fact, probably there's some statement like most polynomials don't have rational roots. I'm sure that's a thing. Um, so, but in any case, what we learned here about this polynomial is that, uh, negative two is a root, for example. So then what do you do once you know that negative two is a root? Well, now you use something called roots factor, the root factor reciprocity, or I'm not sure what to call it, but the relationship between roots and factors of a polynomial. This means, if negative 2 is a root, this means that x plus 2, which by the way is x minus negative 2, is a factor. Awesome. Thanks for letting me know. Sometimes it feels like I'm talking to nobody. So it's good to know that you're there. I appreciate that. So let me divide. So now what I have to do is factor out the x plus 2. And again, I'm trying to be clever about it. I just, just do it. So now um, we're going to do polynomial long division. Okay. And please watch me carefully because I'm very liable to screw this up. Here we go. Here's X plus two, and I'm going to divide it into X to the fourth minus seven X cubed plus nine X squared plus 27 X minus 54. Any better way of doing this that gets me out of doing this? Oh, wait, is there? I don't know. Hey, so 
How many times does x go into x to the fourth? Answer, x cubed times. I know it sounds weird. I, I, I heard about synthetic division at some point in my life, but I don't know what it is. I forgot, sorry. X goes into x to the fourth x cubed times, right? Um, and then I multiply. So I get x to the fourth plus 2x cubed. Then I subtract from the top polynomial the bottom polynomial. And what I'm left with is, I hope, negative 9x cubed plus 9x squared plus 27x minus 54. And now I repeat the process. How many times does x go into not negative 9x cubed? Question mark? Answer? Negative 9x squared. Negative 9x squared times x plus 2 is negative 9x cubed minus 18x squared, which we then, so we subtract. I'm getting all bamboozled by the signs. We subtract from the top polynomial the bottom polynomial. So when we subtract negative 9x cubed from negative 9x cubed, of course we get 0. That's what we want to see. But when we subtract negative 18x squared from there, from 9x squared, we have 27x squared, I hope. And then we drop the rest of this garbage downstairs. x goes into um, 27x squared, 27x times. And now we multiply 27x squared plus 54x. We subtract and we get negative 27x minus 54. x goes into this negative 27 times. And voila, we get negative 27x minus 54, 0. We expect to see a 0 here because we expected the x plus 2 to be a factor. Because we know that um, negative 2 is a root. Why do we know that? Well, either we tortured ourselves, very common in mathematics, by uh, trying all possible rational roots, or we took the expedient route like a, and used a computer, okay. um, which is far superior if you don't like suffering. Okay. Now, we're so in other words, what we've discovered then, what this implies is that this big ass long polynomial. Oh, I've got it written right there. Is equal to x plus 2 times x cubed minus 9x squared plus 27x minus 27. So, great job. We factored it a little bit. Now we have to factor it more. And so we repeat the process, okay? We repeat the process. We, in other words, examine what are the possible roots, What what is a root of this guy here? Now, if you are very clever, you might notice that this thing is x minus 3 cubed, which it is. But how would you notice that? Um, it's a good, fair, good question, a good, high quality question. Anyway, you repeat this process, okay? Uh, and whatever way you can, you can. You have to try to factor this. And after you factor this, then all of a sudden you have a quadratic. If you repeat this process, um, hopefully that sets you on the right path to 
factoring this guy fully. But in the end, what you should get is X after a lot of work. What you should get is X plus two times X minus three cubed. Matrix multiplication? What about it? You just want to see an example? All right. One, zero, two. One, one, zero, 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 three. Is that acceptable? Zero, one, negative one. Oh, a negative number. What have I done? Negative one, zero, one. Zero, one, three. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why I'm finding this funny. Okay, hey, here we go. So to get the, so first of all, it's always good to know that when you multiply a three by three with a three by three, you end up with a three by three. In general, when you have an M by N, that means M rows, N columns, and you have an N by P, that means N rows, P columns, the, you can multiply these things together. And what you end up with is an M by P matrix. Okay. And now if we carry out the multiplication, here's how we do it. We take to get the one one entry, which is the entry up here in the upper left corner, upper left corner, what we do is we take the first row of the matrix on the left row and we interleave the entries of that first row with the entries of the first column. We interleave them. So we take one, put it next to a zero. And when I say put it next to, I really mean multiply. So we take one times zero, which is by the way, zero, plus zero times negative one. Oh, by the way, that's also zero, plus two times zero, which is also zero. So the one one entry of this matrix is zero. Comfy? To get the one two entry, which is right here, it's in the top row, center column. To get the one two entry, you take the one row, the row indexed by one, and the column indexed by two. So that's the top row, interleave it with the entries of the middle column. And what you get is one plus zero plus two. One plus zero plus two, I think that's three. And you can probably guess what you need to do to get the one three entry. You interleave the first row with the third column. So you get negative one plus zero plus six. Negative one plus zero plus six. I think that's positive five. Do you like it thus far? And we just keep doing this. So in the two one entry of this matrix of the product, we take the second row, the two row, row two, that's better. Two one entry, row two, column one, interleave the entries. So we get zero, negative one, zero, that's a negative one. Okay, cool, do I have to keep going? Okay, wait, I'm just gonna do it. This, that, I think that's one. This one and that one feels like zero. Anyway, let me keep going here. Zero, three, nine, I did it. Matrices are everywhere all the time, okay? 
So uh, they're absurdly useful for um, mathematics sake. Uh, they represent what are called linear transformations from one vector space to another. Oh, here's a application you young ones will like. You know those games where you run around murdering each other? Like you run around with your gun and you're, you kill each other. You know those games? Those games, those games require lots of linear algebra. Exactly. Linear algebra, th this stuff, this nerd stuff here, okay? Does that make it relatable? <laughs> yeah, computer graphics requires a tremendous amount of linear algebra to uh, uh, model the worlds that you are running around in and to project those worlds onto your computer screen. There is, of course, also the um, example that sesquipedalianistic alluded to earlier, which is uh, Google's PageRank algorithm basically assembles the Internet or represents the Internet. I don't know how they do it anymore. I'm sure they've improved upon this, but they represent the Internet using an enormous matrix which they compute eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors of. Eigenvectors are some... Thing that you learn about as you go a little bit deeper in linear algebra, but the inc incredibly important. Um, and they, uh, well, like that. What am I trying to say? Um, that algorithm of finding a vector, of, sorry, of finding an eigenvector. Um, of finding of eigenvectors, um, you know, what is their market cap at? Are they a trillion dollar company yet? Or, oh no, they broke up a while back, but anyway. So if you like money, <laughs> okay. Linear algebra and matrices and junk, okay. Um, they're important for physics. Yeah, and Kappa Clause is saying it. Four point five billion. Look, they're important for everything. If there's two, when you're, if you want to call yourself a college-educated STEM lord, then you need to have learned at least calculus and linear algebra. So, we all aspire to be STEM lords, don't we? I mean, I'm already a STEM lord. I'm, I've already, uh, I'm, I'm there. But you all, you all want to be STEM lords when you grow up. So, calculus and linear algebra, okay? Anyway, matrices are baller, okay? Bottom line. But I mean, and well, okay. Actually, the math people are getting mad now because math people don't really like matrices if they don't have to touch them. They feel, I gotta say. At a certain at a certain point, they feel gross. I can't tell you how gross it made me feel to actually do this matrix multiplication. But this is all this is all this is very it's a very advanced, cultivated attitude that I have from my ivory tower. Okay. A clock has an hour hand of length 4 centimeters and a minute hand of length 5.5 centimeters and a second hand of length 6 centimeters. How quickly is the area of the quadrilateral formed by the center of the clock and the tips of the three clock hands changing at exactly 255? Well, let's see. Where are these hands at 255? So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, three here it goes, right? Uh, six and nine. 
So one and two, I know that. And this is 11-ish and 10-ish. Um, 255. The hour hand is four centimeters. So we don't know the exact angle or anything. It's like around there somewhere. The minute hand is 5.5 centimeters. So it's pointing exactly at the 11. And it's a little longer. And then we have a even longer second hand pointing exactly at 12. So clearly this quadrilateral is made up of these two triangles, right? What we want to do is somehow express area of this quadrilateral in terms of the angles that let's say these hands make with respect to this horizontal axis here. So suppose I call this, it, I've drawn it in a weird way, but suppose I call this angle here, I don't know, theta one. So theta one is this angle that we, uh, this that the hour hand makes with the positive x axis. I think that's fine. And I call the angles, this angle here, theta two, the angle that the second hand makes with the positive x axis. And then we have a theta three, which looks like this. <laughs> Sorry. A theta three, which is the uh, minute hands angle with the positive X axis. So then there are various facts that we can say about D theta D, D theta one DT, for example. So we know that it takes um, 12 hours for the hour hand to make one full revolution, right? So it does two pi radians in 12 hours. And we probably want to boil this off into seconds. So this is two pi radians over uh, 12 times 60 times 60. Uh, which is a big number. But that's d theta 1 dt. This is um, 2 pi over 12 times 60 squared radians per second. Right? d theta 2 dt is equal to, uh, well, let's see. Th d theta 2 is the um, seconds hand, right? So it does 2 pi radians in 60 seconds. And then d theta 3 dt that's the minute hand. So it does two pi radians in an hour, which is 60 times 60 radians per second. Oh, and actually these are, are these negative numbers? Cause they're all getting closer to the, um, they're, they're all shrinking in value. So these are all negative, in fact, according to the oddball way that I've drawn these angles, defined these angles. So now we have to figure out the areas of these triangles using the angles theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. So suppose that this is theta here, and this side here is A, and that side there is B. 
Can we figure out a nice expression for the area of this triangle? One half sine theta, uh, one half a b sine theta. So then, let's see, what then is the area as a function of time? Well, let's think of it as being the area of T1 plus the area of T2. What's the area of T1? Well, using this fact, if we can figure out what this angle right here is, then we good. But I think this angle right here is theta three minus theta two. So what we do is one half the length of the minute hand. I don't remember what you said. I, I lost it already. So the hour hand is four centimeters. Four centimeters. The second hand is six centimeters. 5.5. You know what? I can't deal with these numbers right now. So we're going to give these names. Okay. Just, you just have to deal with it. This is the, um, length of, uh, the hour hand. This is the length. I can't even remember that. This is L1. This is L2 and this is L3. Can you deal with that? Okay. So it's, um, the area is the area of T1, which is uh, 1 half L2 times L3, which are just constants, multiplied by the sine of theta 3 minus theta 2. And then we uh, add to this the area of T2. The area of T2 is 1 half uh, L1 times L3 times sine of uh, theta 2 minus theta 1. Does this make sense? So now we have to take dA dt, right? Uh, is that what you wanted? dA dt. So this is one half L1, L2, L3. And now we're gonna DDT this guy. If we DDT that guy, then we get cosine of theta three minus theta two. And then we multiply this by the derivative of theta three minus theta two. That's the chain rule, right? The derivative of theta 3 minus theta 2 is d theta 3 theta t, uh, sorry, d theta 3 dt minus d theta 2 dt. But we have all of these numbers right here and here. Okay. Then we add to this one half, same thing, take d dt of this. Uh, cosine of uh, theta 2 minus theta 1. We multiply this by uh, d theta 2 dt minus d theta 1 dt. I banned him. Oh, I can time him out, huh? I don't know. Uh, I, his name is, it's all gray now. I can't get, I can't figure it out. Okay. Um, yeah. So listen, now we have to figure out 
the specifics of all of these quantities. Fortunately, d theta, d theta, the d theta dt's, right? We already know they're constant. They're these numbers. Okay. So these number, these numbers here, we know the other, the only portion of this problem left is to figure out what, uh, what these guys here are. What do you mean normal Pythagoras? Because remember, I'm looking for the rate of change of the area, not this is DA DT. Wow, Andrew. Okay. Can we agree that the second hand is pointing straight at 12? It's pointing straight at 12, right? So that means that theta 2 is 90 degrees. Uh, oh, we like radians around here. So pi over 2 radians. Now I'm going to do theta 1. No, I'm going to do theta 2, but I'm going to leave it to you to do theta 1, okay? No, I already did theta 2. I'm going to do theta 3. That's the one I'm going to do. But I will leave it as an exercise for you to do theta 1. This is Zelda music. I'm not even sure what game it's from. It's just a rando compilation of things. But let's do theta 2. Or no, say theta 3, I mean. So from the horizontal axis to the second hand is um, theta 3. We need to add a bit more, of course, to it to get all of theta 3. So what we want to add, of course, is the angle between the uh, second hand and the minute hand. But note that at 255 on the dot, the second hand and the minute hand are exactly pointing at 12 and 11. My name, it's my name. My name is Tayo Inoue, or Inoue if you want. Tayo. Just call me Tayo. Um, sure. Now, if the second hand is pointing at 12 and the minute hand is pointing at 11, then the angle between them is exactly 1 12th an entire circle. So this is uh, pi over 2 plus 2 pi over 12. Pi over 2 for the theta 2 that we see here plus pi over 2 pi over 12 more to uh, account for this part right here. And now if you do the uh, math, that's 6 pi over 12, 8 pi over 12, which is uh, 2 pi over 3. So now the final piece is to figure out what theta 1 is. Theta 1. I'm going to leave you to do that. Now... It's, a, it's the hardest one of the three, okay? But here's the way you think of it. it. Um, it's pointing at 2 and 55 over 60 ifs of the way <laughs> between 2 and 3, right? If it was 3 o'clock on the nose, it would be pointing exactly at 3. And if it was 2 o'clock on the nose, it would be pointing at 2. But it's not exactly pointing at two it's not exactly pointing at three it's 55 sixtieths of the way between two and three so your job is to figure out what theta one is once you figured all of that out you crunch the numbers and then you get your answer okay i hope that's helpful you're welcome i took a class from thurston when i was an undergrad at UC Davis. He was a professor there during my time there. And I took a, it was 
a strangely experimental math class. Okay, so it wasn't on his main thread of work, like put it that way. It was more suited for like undergrads. For, yeah, I took it with my wife actually. Uh, we both took it. Um, you know, it was the kind of thing, you weren't like proving things. You were keeping a math journal, things like that. Anyways, one of the things that he wanted us to do in the class uh, was sort of get a feel for what negative curvature means, or what curvature in general kind of means. Um, so he illustrated this by bringing um, out a piece of kale. Now, kale, you should know, is a wrinkly vegetable, but it's sort of wrinkly at a distance. As the sort of like, it gets wrinklier and wrinklier the further out along the leaf you go, if you know what I'm saying, right? Sort of the center of the leaf is sort of more flat more normal but then it fringes out and gets very wiggly the further out along the kale you go and so he used this to sort of demonstrate the idea of negative curvature what we were supposed to do was try to cut out a disc and flatten it on the plane it didn't really work because there's tons of pleats and stuff you know oh yeah yeah it was so i worked uh yeah i did a, a undergraduate independent study with uh dr fuchs he was awesome i really i really love him um such a cool guy just like so nice like i mean he took like an hour out of his week just to talk to me uh about representation theory it was really awesome Um, yeah. Oh, right. And another thing that he had us do, and this is an exercise in that book, Snake Jazz, was, um, and I, and I did it on stream for a bit, was to, I'm so proud of it, so I have to show it off, is to make a surface out of paper where you cut up equilateral triangles. I don't know how well you can see this. Equilateral, tri this is all paper and tape. You cut up equilateral triangles and arrange them so that there are seven at every vertex. You can see that, right? So every vertex other than the boundary vertices here, the vertices on the boundary, have seven equilateral triangles around them. And you very naturally get a surface with non-trivial topology. You get, in other words, like a high genus surface when you do this, which is sort of a reflection of the fact that um, uh, a surface of genus greater than one is hyperbolic, has a natural hyperbolic structure. This is not, of course, a hyperbolic structure exactly. It probably, well, no, it's probably, it is. A uh, piecewise Euclidean structure. But because there are seven triangles around a vertex, because there are seven triangles around a vertex, sorry, you have accumulations of negative curvature at the vertices where there are seven around it. And that causes a global that has a global effect on topology. Is it orientable? Yeah, I think it is. I have to think about that. Uh, how does negative curvature affect the topology? Well, so um, there is a result for surface topology from differential geometry called the Gauss-Binet theorem. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, let's look at it real fast. Because I feel a little bit... I'm a, Oh, Gaub. Excuse me. I said it in the American... I said it the way Americans say it. I apologize to all the Germans in the chat. The Gaub-Binet theorem. Sorry, I know. One of the greatest of all time. And I called him Gauss. 
Okay, um. Galb Bonet Theorem. <laughs> oh, um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so look. This is, so K is roughly speaking the curvature of the surface. It's what it is, it's the curvature. And so you integrate this scalar curvature over the entire surface, okay? And what pops out? What pops out is two pi times something. You know what this something is? It's called the Euler characteristic of the surface. The Euler characteristic is a topological invariant of the surface. And roughly speaking, what it counts, uh, roughly speaking, are the number of holes in the surface. So like a torus, the donut, is has Euler characteristic zero. The round sphere, or the sphere, has Euler characteristic two. If you take a, a two-hole torus, like something like, a, or if you call it, you might call it a surface of genus two. The Euler characteristic of this is negative two. And if you add more holes, you get more negative. Okay, so the Euler characteristic of something like this, uh, I guess, would be negative eight. It's a topological invariant, the Euler characteristic. Okay, but Somehow, when you put a metric on your manifold and you integrate the Gaussian curvature, the Gaussian curvature, excuse me, what you end up getting is 2 pi times the Euler characteristic. Okay? So what this suggests is that there is a very tight relationship between the curvature on the surface and the topology of the surface. Uh, can I explain what a blow up is? Um, it's really more, so that's really more of an algebraic geometry thing, I think. But it has something to do, I think topologically what it is, is taking a connect sum with CP2 or something like that. It's been a very long time since I've thought about it. Well, just uh, topologically sometimes uh, in the context of, if I recall correctly, four manifolds, I learned about blow up. I learned about blow up from uh, Kirby, so, but I can't remember. <laughs> no, this is about the 1966 film for the mathematical operation, see blowing up. What is a manifold? A manifold is like a space where if you, like let's say you lived in the space, 
if you looked around you, no matter where you were, if you looked around you in your immediate vicinity, it would all look always look the same. It would always look like um, RN, an n-dimensional manifold. You always it'll always look like RN around you, no matter where you are in the space. That's, I mean, all I'm saying is the fancy way of saying that a manifold is a locally RN space. It locally looks like RN. <laughs> I don't know why I'm stumbling over my words so much. Um, so like to take an example of a two dimensional manifold, think about like the surface of the earth or something, right? Locally around you, at least when you're thinking about just this part of the earth that is around you, it looks locally like the plane. It's not globally the plane, though, but locally it looks like the plane. And maybe one way to think of it is that you're going to take patches, which look like the plane, and glue them together. And you can imagine this gluing causing interesting, mm, interesting features to appear. Things like this like holes. You see what I'm pointing at down here? Look down here. <laughs> Look down here. See that thing? This thing. You see it? That's a two-dimensional manifold, okay? Because if you are anywhere on there, you look at a tiny enough neighborhood, it will look like the plane. And that's a two-dimensional manifold. There are three manifolds, there are four manifolds, five manifolds, etc. Yeah. Now, another way of thinking about manifolds is that, um, well, you can give extra structure to manifolds. You can give extra structure. You can, um, don't worry about how that extra structure comes about, but that extra structure so you know that, <laughs> I don't know why I'm stumbling. You know that you can do calculus in RN. We all, if you, even if you don't know yet how to do calculus in RN, if you keep going in math, you'll learn how to do calculus in RN. And when you do that, because this thing looks locally like RN, you can transfer ideas of calculus from RN to calculus now on the manifold. It's awesome. So that you can take calculus that you know, that you know how to do, you work it hard, and then you transfer it back onto the manifold. Long line. Yeah. Pretty neat, huh? And then you can decorate manifolds with even more stuff if you want to. Um, but this, we start getting into like sheaves or something. I don't know what. Like you can make your manifolds geometric or, uh, well, you can put a Riemannian metric on it, for example. Or you can give it a complex structure so that it looks locally, not like R2, like maybe this guy does, but looks locally like C. Complex numbers. God, since I was like four years old, five years old, I'm 42 now, so 37 years of my life. But I was a step... <laughs> Or I was an aspiring STEM lord before I knew what the fuck STEM was. STEM is not, STEM is new, okay, people? I'm not sure when it came into uh, common usage, but uh, it's new. STEM was not a thing, no. Not sure when it happened. I think it happened under the Obama administration. Oh, thanks, Obama. Obligatory. No, they don't, which is fine. Like, I was their age once. 
And when I was their age, I was, I was uh, doing everything I can to get, get ahead in math. Like uh, in first grade, I worked through the second grade math book and the third grade math book like as fast as I could. Uh, but they don't have that kind of uh, passion for it, which is fine. It's fine. I, I don't pressure them in that direction. They're into other stuff, which is great. Hey, I love you. Thank you all so much for hanging out. You're all such great people, okay? Really good people. Um, I'm gonna stream again tomorrow. Maybe we'll know more. Know more about human frailty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, I love you all so much. Have a great rest of your evening. I love you. Bye. Peace out, y'all. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know, we'll see. This is too close for comfort. Okay, bye-bye, love you, bye.